Thanks. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm excited to be here. This is my first Gotham Go, so uh, it's a real treat. Um, my name is Alan Shreef. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of Engrok. Um, if you want to find me on the internet, I am incontrievable. Um, so feel free to, to say hi. Um, today we're going to be talking about abstractions. Um, abstractions are a bit of an abstract concept themselves. Um, so we're going to start by getting more concrete. Um, getting more concrete to start with. Um, we just want to give you kind of like a sense of like what we're gonna what we're gonna go through here. Is uh, we'll start with um, you know kind of a, a case study, uh, you know a, a motivating story of like something that we were designing an abstraction we were designing at Ngrok, and I'll use that as an example throughout the talk um, to kind of uh, think about abstractions more broadly, um, and then we'll wrap up with some practical advice about how to design abstractions in your day-to-day -day work. I want you to like come away and take away some like. Uh, ways to think about um, abstractions as you're building them, them yourself. Um, most of what we're going to be talking today about today is not specific to Go. The examples will be in Go, but these are generic examples. You should be able to, like, uh, the concept of software abstractions is really something that you can take and leverage in, in kind of any of the building that you do, uh, regardless of, of the tool chains that you use to build them. Uh, so what we were, the problem we were trying to solve at Ngrok was uh, how do we package Ngrok as a Go library? Uh, hands up, how many of you have used Ngrok before? All right, cool. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Ngrok is a unified ingress platform. It combines like your load balancer, API gateway, CDN, uh, network firewall all into one, uh, one piece uh, that you can put in front of your services to, to make them available or give, uh, create access uh, to them to other uh, users and services. Um, how many of you have used Ngrok as a library? All right, so that's why we were trying to, to solve this problem. Um, this is, for those of you who, uh, who have used it before, this is kind of like what an invocation of Ngrok looks like. Uh, this tells Ngrok uh, it's an executable that you download. You point it at a port on your machine, uh, 80 in this case, uh, where a web server might be listening, and say, uh, you know, I, I would like you to uh, create ingress on this domain to receive traffic on this domain uh, on the internet and send it to uh, the process that's uh, listening on port 80 on, on the machine that I'm running on. Um, we, we were not happy with that experience. Uh, I mean, it's a, a fantastic experience, but we wanted something that was more integrated. We really wanted developers to be able to bake this kind of functionality directly into their own applications, into their own software. Trying to, like, if you wanted to use Ngrok's functionality, like packaging it next to the software that you wanted to distribute um, was a painful thing to do. Um, packaging software is always painful, and adding more things to package just gets worse across operating systems and architectures and things like that. Um, so we wanted to figure out how do we package this as a library. It is super easy, right? You just you just add, create a function call, and that's that's uh, it's a library now, right? So easy. Um, that's the end of the talk. Thank you. Um, <laughs> you can probably guess uh, that's not what we chose, and we'll talk about why we didn't chose that, and why we didn't choose that, and like the design of abstract, uh, you know, the abstraction that we did choose. So this is the API that we did design. Uh, this is a single line of code that when you run it, it connects your local process to all of our global points of presence. Uh, it asks them to hot reconfigure to accept traffic on a domain, and it returns to you a net listener uh, that returns connections that are accepted on all of our global points of presence to your application itself. It feels like you are listening on a local port, but you are really listening on our entire ingress network. Um, that returned net listener uh, can be plugged into any Go code that would otherwise listen on a port, just like uh, like the HTTP server in, in NetHTTP. That is a lot of abstraction <laughs> for one line of code, right? Um, of all of the things that it's doing, that's a lot of heavy lifting that's been baked into just that single piece of code. Um, so I want to step back and talk about like how did we get there? Like what are some of the principles that we were thinking about as we were designing for uh, designing this abstraction? Why did we why did we choose that over something that was more simple like we looked at first? First example is you know kind of an obvious like uh, uh, you know something that's obviously a little too simple, um, but you know how did we get here and what what were the things that we were thinking about? So zooming out, um, I want to talk about abstractions abstractly. Um, and to start with, like, what is an abstraction anyways? 
Um, when I was researching this talk, uh, I naturally went to uh, you know uh, sources that you might consult on the internet to ask like what is an abstraction. Uh, Wikipedia came back with way too many words, as you can see, um, and so I kind of like went searching elsewhere because that was that's that's uh, it's not really helpful, right? Um, and I found a really great uh, piece written by. Um, uh, the valuable dev. Um, and uh, I paraphrased their definition for you here, um, which I really quite like, which is that an abstraction simplifies by providing what you really need and hiding the details. And for me, this is really the core of abstraction. This is really what it gets at. And if you think about it, like, you know, we'll, we'll talk about this in just a second. Like, software is abstraction, right? That is, that is our work, that is our job. And so this is really kind of like the core of software and software engineering. Um, I know that that definition is still like kind of abstract. So one of the really like helpful ways to, to look at it is like, what are some concrete examples? Um, because abstractions are, like I said, everywhere in all the software that we build. Um, so one good example is like your language tool chain, the compiler tool chain, language tool chain, however you want to think about it. Like the Go language itself is an abstraction of Go assembly code, uh, which is actually an abstraction on top of architecture specific assembly code, uh, because there's kind of, it's not, uh, the Go compiler has like an intermediate assembly language. Uh, but even that architecture specific assembly code is really an abstraction for machine code, which is an abstraction for hardware architectures, which is an abstraction for essentially electronics and then like literally like physics underneath it, right? Um, but it really is, uh, you know, and this is just one example. Like, you know, uh, Ngrok and, and myself, like I work in the networking space all day, uh, which is maybe one of the best known uh, sets of layer abstractions in the computing world. This is the OSI model. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with it, um, which is you know, uh, a, a application level protocol on top, which is built on top of an abstraction uh, for encrypted uh, communication, uh, which is TLS, built on reliable transport underneath it, um, and, and so on, down to essentially like the actual like electromagnetic magnetic waves that are transmitted through the air. But essentially all of these pieces are built on the abstractions of the layers below it. It is abstractions all the way down um, in, in software and computing. Um, and that's, that's really why it's such a core topic. Um, and the ones that we're talking about, that you know, those examples that I just showed you, are kind of like really well-known ones. But inside your own software, you are, doing, you are always doing the same things. Um, at Ngrok, we're abstracting application ingress. Um, but what I would challenge you to, to think about in the software that you, you are writing is, what are you abstracting, right? Um, you know, if we look back at that line of code, uh, when I ask, like, what are you abstracting, and we go back to that definition of, you know, what are you providing and what details are you hiding, right? Um, if you know the answer to those questions of what are you providing and what details are you hiding, you've done a lot of the work of figuring out what abstraction to provide already, right? So much flows from that clarity. So for Ngrok, we say, like, the code that you were just looking at is a globally distributed ingress gateway abstracted as a net listener. And finding that clarity really, really helps in deciding like exactly what to build uh, that experience to deliver. Why do we create abstractions in the first place? If we go back to that definition that we talked about, which is that abstractions simplify by providing what you really need and hiding the details, it's really natural to say, well, we create abstractions so that we can hide the details. We create abstractions so that we can just work with, with what we really need. Um, if, you, uh, if you're familiar with this uh, kind of like, um, I don't even know what to call it, axiom, uh, like a uh, thought experiment of why do cars have brakes? Um, the kind of like knee jerk like initial reaction is like so that they can stop, right? Um, but the the actual answer is so that they can go faster, right? Like cars have brakes to enable something that they weren't able to do before, which is to go faster. And so similarly, when you think about like why do we build abstractions in software, it is not so that we can hide details, right? That's in service of the larger goal. And the larger goal is so that we can build more complex software. The quality of our abstractions influences how complex we can build the software, right? Because as developers, as humans, there's only so much that we can keep in our heads. And the systems that we can build are constrained by how much complexity 
an individual developer can manage or a team of developers can manage, but that complexity is ultimately the, um, the limiting function on what we can build in software. And so really abstraction, the core of it, is about expanding that boundary, right? About, about allowing us to reason at a higher layer um, so that we can build more complex software, that we can build more delightful user experiences. Um, what, what makes an abstraction successful? Uh, when you like uh, go go looking on the internet for um, uh, pieces about abstraction, as I did uh, while I was researching this talk, uh, one of the most referenced pieces is uh, a piece written by uh, um, Joel Spolsky of Fog Creek and Stack Exchange fame. Um, it is, uh, I, I put this here um, mostly because I was amused that uh, his example about abstractions is networking um, 20, you know, over 20 years ago. This is not a new problem, this is not a new topic, um, and even the abstractions that we all like talk about and struggle with today in computing are still like very much the same ones that we were thinking about. Um, the, the reason that uh, this piece is referenced so much is that there is a particular quote in it that um, is kind of like a touchstone in, in the pieces uh, in, in people who write about abstractions, which is uh, Joel's assertion that all non-trivial abstractions to some degree are leaky. Um, and I wanted to, to touch on like, what does he mean by a leaky abstraction? A leaky abstraction means uh, you must understand the implementation. Right? That something about the details that were hidden, right? Uh, it provides simplicity, um, but it hides the details. And abstraction is leaky when someone who is using the abstraction has to understand the details, that it didn't completely hide them. And all abstractions, like Joel says, if they're, if they're large enough, um, are leaky. And so a lot of the work that we do, um, that's, that's one piece of it. Um, but more broadly, beyond abstraction just being leaky, is that abstractions always come with a cost. And so I want to talk about those costs, and I want to talk about how we think about those costs and how to like trade them, trade them off uh, against the benefits of abstraction. There are a number of costs to abstraction, um, but uh, I want to talk about these four, which are the ones that um, I'm most often like trading off as I'm building software and, and designing it, um, which are uh, Abstraction costs around performance. Uh, this is like the overhead of an abstraction. Uh, observability of understanding what the thing that's uh, abstracted has done. Expressiveness, um, which is, uh, we'll, we'll dig into that, which is like what you can do uh, with the abstraction. And the last one being cognitive overhead. So starting with uh, first here, uh, I want to talk about observability. Um, Going back to like the thing that uh, I was designing at the beginning um, is you know this this ngrok library, which is that normally like the thing that we're like kind of like the the analogy here of what this otherwise would be is listening on a local port, um, and so it the local port like receives connections, but when we're listening on ngrok's global network, we had to ask ourselves well sometimes that connection is going to get interrupted between your service and our service, right? But the existing APIs, right, that you use to, to kind of negotiate uh, accepting traffic don't have any mechanism to communicate that back to you. There's a missing piece that, that's really like, what happens when that connection drops? Like, you want to know as an application developer. And so our solution for this was to basically add uh, another option that basically gives you like a handler, a callback that says, we'll tell you when, when the connection drops so that you can know. And this is a way in which the abstraction is leaking, right? Um, or the abstraction gets more complex. We're trading off like what details we show you to give you more observability. We could easily have made the, com the abstraction uh, simpler by not offering this. And so there are less function calls, less pieces of the API to understand um, at the cost of you not understanding when this happens. Uh, I think uh, you will probably all um, have uh, experienced some kind of frustration working with an API or library and saying, like, I want to know when that thing has happened, but it didn't export that thing. I can't get access to it to know what it's doing. Uh, this is exactly what that, that feels like. Observability is really about what can't I see, right, that's actually happening underneath the hood. When you're faced with designing abstractions like this, um, the pattern that I have seen that is the most powerful and popular, although difficult to uh, not like the easiest to implement, but it really like provides the most powerful uh, way to get observability while limiting the API uh, exposure and allowing your 
uh, application to the API, the, the abstraction to remain simple, is uh, there are a number of uh, things that provide like an event um, framework uh, or an event or tap uh, sometimes they're called. Uh, you know, a lot of like very early versions, uh, uh, really powerful implementations of this have shown up in operating systems, operating system kernels. Uh, these things like look like in uh, in Linux uh, land, like kernel probes or system tap. If you're familiar with those tools, Dtrace and Solaris, Windows. I forget what they, their kernel events are called, but they have a similar one. If you're thinking about the Go world, um, the pprof events, like uh, Go applications will export to you like when your application is going to block on a Go routine for performance uh, diagnostics. And so these hooks like deep into the system that allow like uh, you to your application to block on a channel without like surfacing some visibility during the channel blocking call to tell you like what other Go routine was it blocked on, right? There's an, another way to get that. Um, so this is one of the ways that I've found that's been really helpful to build that observability into uh, the abstractions that you're building without compromising uh, too much of the simplicity of the abstraction itself. Uh, expressivity. Um, this is about uh, asking, like, with the abstraction that I have, can I do all the things underneath it that I would have been able to do if I had those raw primitives underneath it? This is an interesting one because only some of the abstractions that we build uh, really care about this. Um, but uh, I imagine many of you will have had a similar experience when you're working with an API saying like, I want to do that thing, but it's not exported. It has like a method in there and I really want to be able to call it, but I can't have access to that thing. Uh, that's, that's what that, like this frustration like really manifests as. Um, it is one of the, the like kind of like most key and important design decisions when you're thinking about uh, designing um, abstractions and building them is how, how much expressivity do you uh, create? There are some abstractions where you really don't lose any expressivity, but usually we are making a trade-off um, between how much we expose uh, and the surface, how complex our API is, right? Um, how, how complex the abstraction is. And if you draw the slider kind of all the way to the right and uh, you make sure that you can do everything that you can do under the hood, uh, you kind of end up in a situation where you start to realize like, oh, I haven't abstracted away anything, right? <laughs> I've just like given you another API on top of this, um, another abstraction on top of it and not really like hidden any details. Um, so this is a really like challenging slider to draw. Um, and uh, really one that you, know, you need to spend a lot of time thinking about uh, your customer, really, um, the, the users of the abstraction, the, the consumers, to understand where to pull that slider. Uh, performance. Um, this is kind of like a what will it cost me um, question. Uh, you know, the example uh, Joel's blog post uh, talks about uh, NFS, which is an abstraction that provides files uh, on your computer, but the files are hosted somewhere else on a network far away. Uh, EBS, if you're you know, in Amazon land these days, uh, is a similar abstraction at a, albeit different layer um, of network attack attached block storage. Um, but you know, that abstraction like, has a performance cost, right? And one that will sometimes bite you, where you will try to read a file on disk and you are expecting that disk to be in the machine that you are working on, but sometimes it is not. And sometimes it has to go across a network. And the assumptions that you made about how long it could take to do that or whether that operation could fail um, are suddenly gone and so that's a place where that abstraction leaks um, and where you as a developer have to like make um, allowances for it defer is a good example from the go uh, world of defer used to essentially allocate on the heap and the cost of like writing a defer function up until I think it was go 114 or so uh, was actually a lot larger than if you had simply like injected those statements at the end of every branch in a function. And so as a developer, like this was a cognitive overhead for you when you were building like really performance critical code is saying like, can I use defer in this situation? Like, is that is that worth it to um, for me as a place where the abstraction breaks because you need to understand the performance before you use the thing. Um, when you're like in this world, like a thing that uh, a lot of like the terminology you'll see very often, especially in folks who are debating, like who are in like language wars um, and like to talk about things between like 
memory managed languages and manually managed languages like C and Go or Java and Rust, things like that, are about zero cost abstractions. Um, and these are kind of like the holy grail of abstractions where you don't eat any performance cost when you use them. And sometimes this is a thing you can do. It is obviously like really nice when you can do it. Uh, but for most of us, um, we have to make a choice. Um, performance is a really complicated topic. Um, it is very multifaceted. Like, what performance are you talking about? Are you talking about memory or disk? Are you talking about uh, you know, uh, CPU cycles or wall clock time? Uh, which you know, battery life? Like, these are all resources to manage, and performance like varies. Performance really depends on who, like who's using it and what do they care about. Um, and so when you're thinking about performance, when you're designing this, like uh, what I'm always thinking about is like what what does someone care about, right? It's it's like product design um, as you're like you know building these abstractions of saying like what does the user really care about from a performance standpoint. Um, for folks who build things like Go, this is much more challenging because you're talking about many, many different like users, right? Who have many, uh, many different use cases, and someone cares about disk, and someone cares about battery, um, and so in those cases, you're always chasing, um, you know, zero cost abstractions or as close as you can get to it, um, right? Because you're trying to appeal to so broad of an audience. Uh, for me, like you know, just like finger in the air, like very like broad rules of thumb are I try to like not increase the the like overall like big O complexity of the things that I do from like runtime standpoint um, and like usually be on the same order of magnitude. Those are like just very good like guide rules of like you never should be like trying to do more than that. Um, but that's uh, kind of a place to start. Um, and the last one is uh, cognitive overhead. Um, every uh, additional like exported symbol in in your API is a cost, right? Cognitive overhead is about like I'm using a an abstraction, like how I have to like learn something new, right? And learning something new is a cost, right? Because we talked about like uh, software being limited by what we can keep in our heads, and so the more things that we keep in our heads, the the more things we have to keep in our heads, the less we can build. And so that is the cost of abstraction. Is another thing that you have to keep in your head. Sometimes it's a new domain model, and you're like, I like, I know what a disk operation is, but what is a file now? What's a file read? What's a streaming file read? Like these are all new concepts that you have to learn, right? Like what is a web socket? Like these are new abstractions that we built, and so they all come with a cost cognitive cost. Uh, for me, um, actually, I'll, let me get there. Uh, so the, the kind of like things that I ask myself when I'm like building abstractions here are things like, you know, you know what, what can I pull away? What's the least thing that I can do? This is kind of like that, that uh, probably many times misattributed Mark, uh, apocryphal quote to Mark Twain of like, you know, if, if I could have, like, I would have, you know, made a smaller, I would have written something smaller, I would have written something less. Um, this is always what I'm, I'm striving for in abstraction is like what's the least amount of additional cognitive overhead uh, that I can, can place on someone. Part of that is like can you reuse an, an existing abstraction, right? If there are well-known abstractions, things that exist in like the standard library or exist in the language ecosystems that you use, being able to piggyback on those concepts that people already know uh, allows you to reduce that overall cognitive burden. So for me, like when I'm designing like Go package APIs, for example, uh, I will literally like keep this open in a tab as I like work on the system to say like, what is this going to look like as someone like uses this package? This is like their consumption of the package to me, and so that is the product experience that we're delivering, right? And so this is kind of like what I look at. I will like sometimes even try to optimize the APIs so that they all like slot nicely under the tabs where I expect you to want to find them. Um, these are other ways that like this is you know kind of silly in that we're like coding to a documentation tool, uh, but ultimately that is how we how we consume these abstractions. Um, and so thinking about them in that way is a way that you can reduce the cognitive overhead on on the developers who are consuming the abstractions that you build. Uh, the other thing that, that I frequently do um, to try and reduce cognitive overhead is to start with uh, the calling code first before I actually design the abstraction. Is saying like, how would I like to use it? Um, in other ways, in other worlds, this is sometimes called README-driven development or press release-driven development, whatever you want to call it. Of like starting with like, what are you going to tell people about this? Is how it's used, um, and that often can be really clarifying in understanding 
exactly the experience that you want to deliver um, because you can usually start from that like kind of clarity and simplicity of the thing that you want to consume and build towards that. Um, and then, like I said, the other, the other example is about reusing existing uh, abstractions, which is uh, what Ngrox library does, which is it reuses the net listener abstraction, right? So that is something that everyone who works in Go uh, and has written like kind of any network software in it has like experienced this and used code that calls it. And so that's one of the ways that we reduced kind of like the new things that you had to learn when you were using the Ngrox uh, library and API was that this is already a concept that you're familiar with is like, I already understand a socket and I already understands the primitives of how it works and that it accepts connections. And so being able to slot into that reduces the amount of things that you have to learn. And it also has the really nice benefit of allowing you to drop it into existing code um, without additional work. A successful abstraction is about balance. You are balancing hiding complexity at the expense of performance, observability, loss of expressiveness, and cognitive load. At the end of the day, like success is even more than that. Like that is about the success of an abstraction itself. Um, but su success of like an abstraction is really like whether an abstraction is successful uh, is what I was talking about. But whether uh, your abstraction is a success is uh, more than just that. Like one is you need to get the abstraction right, and then also like all of the other things that you would expect about building products come into play. Like creating great documentation and designing your API well, uh, advocacy, like what I'm doing right now. These are all like components of like, is your abstraction really going to be successful? And so that's uh, kind of like where I wanted to end um, is kind of like walking you through how we like ended up into this place where we like built uh, you know a, a line of code that could abstract this very complex ingress problem that that Ngrok solves into something that you can embed really cleanly into your Go application um, and hopefully take away like some lessons about how to think about abstraction that you can apply to to the uh, the software that you build every day. Um, that's it. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs>